My name is C.D. Covington. I'm a science fiction writer, and I am also a linguist, and I would like to discuss some important papers in sociolinguistics as a bit of a series for science fiction writers to and fantasy to help you, us, uh, develop world building a little better. The first paper I'm going to talk about is uh, Empirical Foundations for a Theory of Language Change, published by Weinreich, LeBeouf, and Herzog in 1968. To set the stage a little bit for when this uh, paper was published in the 60s, 50s and 60s, linguistics wanted to become a more scientific discipline. And in, in that milieu, the search for language universals began because finding a universal theory was more scientific. Uh, 1965, Chomsky published Aspects of the Theory of Syntax, which is the foundational book for formal and structural linguistics, the branch known as generative syntax or Chomskyan syntax. Uh, there was research going on at the time on dialects and regional variation. This research is ongoing. Uh, one of the key figures at that time was Delheims. He studied anthropology and ethnology of language change or language and speaking. That is uh, how different how people spoke in different parts of the U.S. That was his focus. 1963, Bill LaBeouf, then a grad student, uh, published a paper on the social motivation of a sound change. Up until this time, historical linguistics and philology, which are very similar but not exactly the same, uh, they focused on describing the changes that were seen in historical texts as they were seen because we didn't really have, we don't really have a lot of social information from texts written a thousand years ago. They could only base their hypotheses on what they could detect and see in the texts. Then in 1966, Lobov, still a grad student, I believe, uh, proposed the linguistic variable as a structural unit. So we have variables in disciplines like math, chemistry, physics. So why shouldn't we have them in linguistics? And then one of the more pivotal studies uh, was 1966, again, I believe it was a book, The Social Stratification of English in New York City. This is also known as the fourth floor experiment. So what is this experiment? It was an observational study of employees at three different department stores in New York City. These department stores were chosen based on the demographics of the shoppers, and this was used as a proxy for social and socioeconomic class. The most expensive store was considered as a proxy for upper middle class. The mid-range store was for middle class, and the lower range store was lower middle class and working class. So LeBeouf went to these stores and asked the employees where he could find an item that he knew was on the fourth floor and noted the rhoticity of the words. Rhoticity is the presence of an R and how much R there is present in a word. The specific example we're looking at here is the fourth floor. You can find ladies' shoes on the fourth floor. You can find them on the fourth floor. So the increased rhoticity, so more R, was associated with higher social class, socioeconomic class. He kept calling it social class in the paper. And with aspirational social class, that is, the mid-range store showed more R's than the high end because the people in that milieu wanted to appear more upper middle class. So they hyper-corrected and used R's more often. And the low end store showed the fewest number of R's. The theater theoretical implication from this is that we can study social aspects of language by using markers for, in this instance, socioeconomic class and race, because often, even today, uh, the lower socioeconomic class is often non-white. The empirical foundations that this paper wishes to discuss are based on the observation that Structural theories of language 
so fruitful and synchronic investigation have saddled historical linguistics with a cluster of paradoxes which have not been fully overcome. What does that mean? The cluster of paradoxes that um, the paper refers to are this. These language changes. This is an inescapable fact. The neo-grammarians were a uh, historical linguistics movement from the mid 19th century who believed that all sound change was able to be predicted and modeled based on patterns. And according to them, the language of the individual is the most legitimate object of linguistic study. Chomsky 57 agreed with this position and it underlines the foundations of generative syntax or Chomsky and generative syntax. A very simplified uh, summary of this position is that a speaker is fluent in their native language and their knowledge of grammar or linguistic competence is the true measure of linguistics. Grammar in this sense isn't what you learned in high school or elementary school, but it's the mental structure of language, like how language is represented within your brain. So that is knowing that the dog bit the man is an English sentence, but bit dog the man the is not an English sentence, is the basis of linguistic competence. So the language usage is variable. We have synonyms and things like that. Uh, we use different structures in different situations. One example is that coordinating that isn't required in English. I know that this guy is blue and I know this guy is blue are both equally valid English sentences with no difference in meaning. So if language change is inevitable and the only legitimate object of linguistic study is the individual speaker and their individual grasp of their individual grammar, how on earth do we explain why language changes? How do we explain the fact that usage is variable? In this paper, Weinreich, Lebov, and Herzog uh, propose that a model of language which accommodates the facts of variable usage and its social and stylistic determinants not only leads to more adequate descriptions of linguistic competence, but also naturally yields a theory of language change that bypasses the fruitless paradoxes with which historical linguistics has been struggling for over half a century. In plain English, plainer English, a model of language that looks only at linguistic competence, i.e. what the neo-grammarians and Chomsky propose, it does not sufficiently explain how and why language changes. We need to look at social factors that influence individual speakers' language choices, as well as factors that influence stylistic choices in order to fully explain how and why language changes. And Thus was the intense animosity between sociolinguists and formal linguists born. Persists to this day, and I don't know if it'll ever die out. One thing we can agree on, however, is that there is no one true correct language and that no language or language variant is superior or inferior to another. These are the questions that need to be answered by any sort of theory of language change that the empirical foundations are being laid here for. Why does language change? What actuates a language change? Why does language A undergo change X and similar language B does not? Why does change X occur now as opposed to in another time period? What constrains language change? What transitional stages can be observed? How are changes embedded in the rest of the language model? And how do we evaluate the effects these changes have on, for example, communicative efficiency? The key points from this paper are, this is not a theory of linguistic change. They aren't proposing one. They, all they are proposing to do is lay the groundwork for people to build on because the information and data that they had 
was not sufficient to attempt anything that ambitious. They proposed empirical foundations, as the title, title suggests. That is, empirical findings which indicate fruitful research avenues in which a theory must account for, conclusions about the min minimal complexity of linguistic structure and the ways to define it, and methods for relating the concepts and statements to empirical evidence, i.e. rules. The S-curve of change was originally described by Hermann Paul, one of the neo-grammarians, in 1880, and it is still one of the base assumptions in sociolinguistic research today. A specific language change, as you can see down here, that T1, starts out in a small number of speakers, spreads over time, and at one sometime point, it spikes and then plateaus. Language change is driven by children and youth. An earlier model suggested that language change occurred between generations, that is, parents transmitted a slightly different language or form of language to their children, which they passed on to theirs, and they passed on to theirs, and so on, and so on, and so on. No effects of the speech community were considered. That means they didn't, uh, didn't consider how uh, influence from grandparents, peers, affected the language of the learner. Real world data suggests this is not how it works. Children develop the med mental grammars, remember this is the underlying structure of language in your brain, through adolescence and their language is, the language use is influenced more by their peers than by their parents, which has been, this has been backed up by many, many studies in the 50 plus years since this paper was published. Halle's model doesn't answer where the change came from and it assumes that the change is complete within one generation. And historical sources refute this very easily. The big takeaway, the big thing that they propose in this paper is structured heterogeneity. What is that? Because language doesn't change instantaneously, as we've established. We, as users of language, are exposed to more than one system and are generally able to understand another system when it's in use, even if we don't use it ourselves. The three examples I have are vowel shifts, vowel mergers, but it doesn't apply only to vowel, uh, sound changes. It applies also to grammatical changes, vocabulary changes, and all that sort of thing. So bag raising is not part of my native video. Like I'm from the East Coast, Central, uh, Mid-Atlantic, Central Maryland, to be specific. Uh, bag raising is a phenomenon seen primarily in the Michigan area, that region up there. It's called the Great, the Great Lakes or Northern Cities vowel shift. It's ongoing. It's still happening and it is progressed even further in the many years since this uh, paper was published so rather than asking if someone wants a bag if you're from like detroit they'll say do you want a bag so like bag becomes beg almost and then the pin pen merger will be familiar to anyone who spent any time more south than north carolina North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, et cetera, uh, out into Tennessee, um, Oklahoma, Arkansas, that whole area. And it's, as you see, pin and pen are pronounced the same, both as pin. He writes with a pin. And the caught, caught merger is happening, I believe, primarily started on the West Coast, but it's spread out. Over, all over the country and seems to be more prevalent in younger generations than older. I do not have it, but the vowels in caught and caught are coming closer together and kind of averaging out some in the middle like caught. Yeah, I don't have this merger, so I can only get my vowel a little bit off. But um, so caught 
he caught cold when he slept on a cot. But if you have the merger, it's going to be more like he caught cold when he slept on a cot. The changes that uh, occur diffuse into wider use, and eventually one of them wins out, that is, becomes dominant. Why and how this happens is still under debate today. We don't really know. There's just sort of happens. We have some theories, but it's really hard to prove anything. The structured part of the heterogeneity comes in here. These systems exist simultaneously, sometimes even within the same person. And so they have to have some sort of structure to them. So our heterogeneity, our variability has to be structured. Otherwise it'll just be a really confusing mess, right? So speakers don't speak a certain way at random. There's an underlying reason for it, whether it's conscious or unconscious. One of the things, one of their foundation uh, empirical uh, foundations is to explain language change, you must consider social factors, not exclusively structural ones. So structural means, for example, phonetics, morphology, how words are put together, how sounds are put together, how words are formed, verb, verb endings and noun endings, which English doesn't really have much of anymore that structure. So quota quotation from the article, sociological factors solidly formulated have now been adduced to explain distributions and shifts in linguistic phenomena, which from a structural point of view would have been seen as random. They're not random. A little sidebar, there is no such thing as free variation. That is randomness. Generativists, Chomskyists, Chomskyans like to say that linguistic variables exist in a state of free variation. For example, coordinating that, like I mentioned earlier, can be there or not be there, and there's no deeper reason for it. It's just random. But that's not true. And we can prove it. Torres Kukulos and Walker did a corpus study on that to show that the conjunction that is more likely to appear in several situations. There, if there's a long distance between the main verb and the that clause. For example, the latest data from climatologists shows with an undeniable degree of certainty that the planet is on track to irreversible warning, warming. If I left that, that out, it would be a little bit awkward. I'll just read it out of that. The latest data from climatologists shows with an undeniable degree of certainty the planet is on track to irreversible warming. Did that feel wrong to you? Did that sound wrong to you? It felt very wrong to me. Like that, that needs to be there. Uh, there's another situation in which it, that appears more commonly, more frequently, less commonly used or ambiguous main verbs. This paper finds that frequently used verbs are less likely to change than infrequently used verbs. I could leave that out. This paper finds frequently used verbs are less likely to change than infrequently used verbs is the second way without that a little more confusing perhaps perhaps so we'll put a that in there because find could refer to you know you find something that you lost you find an object so if it said this paper finds frequently used verbs maybe it was looking for maybe it was looking for verbs but then you get a you get r less likely and you have to stop and think a second so Clarity sometimes demands that. The data exists. We have the tools now to mine it. Computers, massive text databases. We can search them now, it's amazing. But generativists aren't really interested in it. They're interested primarily in native speaker judgments, which is when you write a sentence and ask a native speaker, if they accept the sentence as a sentence or not, they accept it as grammatical. So am I salty about it? Maybe just a little. Another aspect of social, social? sociolinguistics as a 
theory and social, social evaluation. We both consciously and unconsciously evaluate or judge other people's ways of speaking. And we can consciously choose a more prestigious variant in certain circumstances. And prestigious is in very big air quotes right there because prestige is assigned by society, not the language. I'll have to make a second video about that. Otherwise, this will be like a three hour video. The screenshot on the left, these are both from Weinreich, Lebov, and Herzog, is an, as a discussion of evaluation, social evaluation of a few different words, uh, sound variations. So the words and or vase inserted into a reading text are the cause of extraordinary vacillation and confusion. Heavily marked O vowels in office, chocolate, and coffee are lowered irregularly to a, uh, and thus contrast weakly with a uh, and o. Uh. Speakers who use er in bird ridicule the stereotype oi, which they perceive in others as void. So we have office, chocolate, and coffee. Those are very, I guess, Long Island variants. And Boyd, we all, we, we all know that from Bugs Bunny, basically. Uh, I, I like the little footnote here for ant, regarding ant and vase, or at least vase. One speaker resolves the confusion between vase and vase. These large ones are my vases, but these small ones are my vases. The second one, the graph here, is a depiction, uh, is an illustration of change over time in the positive prestige of the R. So in fourth floor, you can see that up until about age 35 to 39, there's a very high uh, consideration of prestigiousness with presence of R. So fourth floor is more prestigious than fourth floor. And when you get to 40 to 49, between 35, between 39 and 40, it drops down a lot. And you'll find a, a lower opinion of fourth floor than fourth floor. To summarize their foundational principles, one, Linguistic change is not to be identified with random drift proceeding from inherent variation in speech. Linguistic change occurs when an alternation is taken up by a subgroup of speakers and this change diffuses then into the general population of speakers. So it starts in one group and then spreads. The association between structure and homogeneity is an illusion. Within a speech community, there is orderly differentiation or um, orderly heterogeneity, heterogeneity of styles through a system of rules. Not all variability in heterogeneity in language structure involves change, but all change involves variability in heterogeneity. So in order for change to happen, there has to be something variable going on. Four. The generalization of linguistic change is neither uniform nor instantaneous. So it takes time to diffuse through a population, doesn't go from parent to child, nor does it go immediately overnight. Five, the grammars in which linguistic change occurs are grammars of the speech community. So individual grammars of individual speakers, also known as, idio also known as idiolects, are not where language change occurs. That is, generative syntax cannot explain why language change occurs or where it occurs or how it occurs. Six, linguistics change is transmitted within the community as a whole. It is not confined to discrete steps within the family. The generation gap is not where language change is found as was previously believed. Seven, linguistic and social factors are closely interrelated in the development of language change. Explanations which are confined to one or the other aspect, no matter how well constructed, will, fa will fail to account for the rich body, body 
of regularities that can be observed in empirical studies of language behavior. That is, we can't look exclusively at structure. We can't look exclusively at society to explain language change. We have to look at both. Should you read this paper? Absolutely. Will you understand it if you're not a linguist? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, it's a very long paper. It's 100 pages. They're half size pages. So it's closer to 50, 50 letters, 50 letter pages. Uh, but it is basically the foundational text of sociolinguistics. It contextualizes the theory and the reasons they propose it. Uh, also, it is written in mid 1960s academic keys, very dense and very much liking to show off how fancy their word structures can, Zen structure can be. So some of the ideas have become dated or been superseded through newer research, but it's an important basis nonetheless. It was published 60 plus years ago. And obviously in 60 years, something new is gonna happen. 60 years ago, chemistry was very different too. Um, you can't see where we're going unless you know where we've been. If you want to read it, the full text is available as a PDF from various sources online. You just have to put it in your favorite search engine. Here are these citations. If you want to read these, I will leave these up for a little bit. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope to make more videos like it in the future uh, about different papers and put them all together in a sort of a series of videos on sociolinguistics for writers. Thanks for watching. Oh, if you liked the video, uh, like and subscribe. Um,